It was also the end of an era for the local linen trade when Bestbrook Mill closed for business. Once people flocked out of Newry in their hundreds to work in the linen mill, which was the centerpiece of this Quaker model village, a purpose-built mill town which famously had no pub, no pawn shop and no police station. The electric tram built in 1885 to bring coal and flax from the wharfs in Newry continued to bring workers to the mill in Bestbrook until 1948. I think it only did about five or six miles an hour. And it went under the 18 arches, the viaduct. I think when I was going under it too, the main Dublin train went over this. <laughs> I was looking at the thing overhead, you know. And that's very exciting now, because it would be only my generation who had ever been near it. They used to say if they threw your school bag out, you could jump out and get it, and like run after the tram and get in again. There's a magazine about the tram, and my sister is standing in the tram doorway getting out of the tram. Halfway between Newry and Bestbrook, yeah. there was an electric dynamo where the mum would then and give it a shot to take it up the hill. When the tram was there, I never missed getting on the bus. I think there was only one bus, or maybe two, which meant that I would have been in Newry in 10 minutes. The tram made them there for half an hour. It was only 20 minutes, but I still learned how to walk on all the mile when I got to Newry. I lived on the road leading into Newry at the time, and I remember the, the uh, workers coming out in the morning, walking, early, early in the morning, loads of them walking out of Newry. And that would have been about three and a half miles, wouldn't it? Yep. To come out to their work. And then some of them in the spinning and everything worked in their bare feet. And because there was a lot of water, you see? A lot of water in the spinning. And they used yeah, the water just flowed across their feet all and the time. They and it, like they'd been standing most of the day and then walking back to near it. Linen manufacturing was at its peak in Northern Ireland in the early 1900s. Believe it or not, Bestbrook Mill alone had around 4,000 workers. I left school at 14 and started in Bestbrook Mill. I think there was the day after my 14th birthday. And I might as well tell you, having never been in a factory and gone into a room about 100 yards long with about 100 machines in it, and the noise and the heat and the steam for a young fellow who had never been there, I was scared stiff. But after about a week or two, you found out and got talking to other people. And the older women were great. They really looked after you well. Some of them knew my mother, and that was a big plus as well. And then after a while, they were giving you sandwiches. I think I was that skinny. I think they were trying to build me up a bit. And the weaving shed where I worked, there was over 100 looms, and that noise. You had to learn to lip read, because if one of the attendants was working away over at the far side of the shed, and he wanted, uh, say, a five-eight spanner. He wasn't walking over. He'd said, "You great five-eight spanner." He had to read the lips and take it over to him. There was a big alleyway up the centre, clear. The machines all were long ways, facing each other. Now, a girl would be responsible for those two sides of that, but down at the end, they always had a stool. And once they had everything running, they used to just sit and watch to see where something go wrong. But quite often, a couple of them would be talking. And I would be quite often pretending I was oiling the machine. And if I looked down, they immediately put their hand up to their mouth. Because they knew I could lip read. And I'm not going to go into any of the stories <laughs> I heard, but it was interesting. No sooner had the sound of the loom ceased than Bestbrook reverberated to noise of a very different kind. John Davis's garden backs onto what at one time was the busiest heliport in Europe. I've moved into, I suppose you could call it a military war zone. It was absolutely bustling with noise. The noise was horrendous. There would have been flights every eight minutes. And that would have been your Lynx or your Gazelles or the Wessex. John made a virtue out of his home's proximity to the helicopters. As a keen amateur filmmaker and photographer, 
It provided him with plenty to film. It was my private air show. You could say, like, I was in the right place at the right time. Sitting in the house, I could tell, oh, that's the Wessex taking off. Oh, that's the Chinook coming in. We had names of the helicopters. We call the Chinook the egg mixer because of its sound coming from two miles away. You could hear from two miles away. So that gave me time to take my photographs and that. The stage you could tolerate the noise and the stage you couldn't. Sometimes the noise would be so unbearable. I would put headphones on and cut the grass and just get on with weeding the garden and then uh, go and hang the washing out, whatever had to be done, just get on with it. Nothing was going to stop me. And uh, you just had to get on with your life. You can't let it hold you up. It was just part of normal living in Bestbrook. John knew this wouldn't last forever. And when the day came that Bestbrook military base was to close, he was there to capture it on camera. This was the last helicopter to take off from Bestbrook Heliport, and it signaled the end of Operation Banner. I was really delighted that I was uh, granted permission to get the shot, and it's a super shot because I knew I had to get this one right, and I was so delighted with the shot, I thought, wow, what a shot to get. I couldn't believe it. It's history. It's a moment in history. Seeing the